It's often said that it takes a village to do the work of a family, but in Boston's changing urban fabric, the connections that help people feel at home have to be updated. That especially goes for life during a pandemic when connections are more limited. One response to that is the Good Neighbors program put together by city agencies and the social enterprise nonprofit Nesterly. To tell us about the effort is the director of the Mayor's Housing Innovation Lab, Dr. Taylor Kane. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, Doctor. Yeah, thank you so much for having me today. Doctor, I'd like to start with the urban fabric, which didn't seem to be uh, so worrisome uh, a year ago, but uh, what is it about life in the city, the kind of family and friend connections that we used to think of as normal and now they're maybe a little more stretched in? Yeah, I can definitely speak to that. Um, so cities are amazing places to live, uh, as, as folks, folks who call Boston home would likely say. Um, but we also know that cities have been changing over the past uh, several decades and more recently thinking about how our urban populations are shifting. We know that older adults are one of our fastest growing populations in Boston. Um, and many of those older adults have long called Boston home and have built relationships with their health providers here, with service providers, with their neighbors, with their family. Um, but more recently, um, some of those, those points of connection, those points of community aren't as easily accessible. Um, so we've been thinking a lot about how do we uh, really connect older adults to different types of things that they need in this particular moment and really try to foster those connections across different generations um, of folks who are trying to call Boston home. Uh, I'm imagining right now in Boston, even when there isn't much economic hardship involved, you still might have people who are getting older, uh, they don't have as many children as their parents did maybe, and the children they do have might live in other states. Uh, so what about their psychological needs right now? Yes, I think that's a great point, um, that social isolation is, is something that um, older adults and also many other communities are really grappling with right now. Um, and so particularly those without uh, family members nearby um, who can't quite connect with their neighbors in the same way, um, look at really looking for opportunities to still feel some type of, of connection. Um, and we also know that uh, many older adults in our city um, are facing difficulties around economic security in terms of uh, reaching retirement age or having limited income. So that social connection piece is both um, helpful for folks in terms of maintaining a connection to police, but also can be a way of helping folks get access to different types of services that they need um, to really be able to stay in their homes. Well, what about just the starting point uh, when one of the people you just described uh, wants to ask for help, and uh, maybe, maybe they have a hard time getting themselves to do that. What about that barrier? Yeah, that's a, it can be a significant barrier. And I think one of the ways that we've been trying to think about that um, is this work that we've been doing with Nesterly, who's been the partner that we've been working with around intergenerational home share. And really um, what's been incredible about that program is really leading with building relationships, with trying to answer questions um, and with really this attempt to um, demystify as much of a, of a process as, as possible and start with what are your needs, what are you looking for, and what are the questions that you have. I mean, sometimes that just starts with a phone call. It starts with a conversation and then building, building from there. So really trying to move as, remove as many barriers um, as possible and being creative around the different points of connection. So there is an online platform that folks can use um, to, to interface uh, with our partner. Um, but there's also this ability to just kind of get on a phone call with someone if that's an easier way of connecting. What about uh, the need to get food? Now, now a lot of uh, people, they might feel it's safe to go to a supermarket, but there are other people, um, they need to think carefully about doing that. Can you help people who are straddling the fence? Yes, definitely. So one of the things that, that we've stood up over the course of the past month 
is this Good Neighbor program, as you've mentioned. And so really what that allows older adults to do is submit a request for uh, assistance picking up something from a grocery store, from a food pantry. Um, also, there's a component around uh, just getting a phone call as well. Um, but this is a way for a volunteer in their neighborhood or in another city in, in Boston to help an older adult get access to that resource that they need. And so it just starts with completing that simple request form. So we can send that out to our volunteers who can then say, yes, this is something that I can complete. Um, and they go to either that grocery store, that food pantry, pick up the, the item that the older adult has requested, and then can drop it off at their home from a safe distance um, and allow that older adult to take it up to their, to their place of residence. And I'm sure mentioned medications. You do those too, right? Yes, yes. So we've really tried to cover a range of, of bases. So we know that food is incredible. Food is always incredibly important, um, but meeting our essential needs around food, around medicine, and around social connection are the, the pieces that we've uh, highlighted over the course of the past few months. But then there's also this capacity to be a little flexible. So in the summertime, really we're thoughtful about how can we help get older adults who might not have access to air conditioning, fans um, to keep them cool. As we think about the weather getting colder, how can we help connect older adults to folks who can help them shovel their uh, front side sidewalk. Um, so it has this capacity both to meet essential needs, um, but also as the seasons change and needs change being adaptable for that. Well, we should, you know, uh, maybe you and I might think of uh, temperature as, as comfort level, but, but when we're talking about older people, it could be a lot more serious than that, couldn't it? Y yes, in terms of, of the temperature both inside the home, but also the temperature um, outside. We know that, that snow shoveling can be a very strenuous activity, um, especially as the, the seasons change. And then we know as folks are spending much more time inside their homes that that internal experience, the internal, internal temperature of housing um, is incredibly important and can have real health impacts um, for older adults. Well, to make this program work, you need a lot of volunteers making the call, maybe running the errands, dropping things off. Can you tell me a little bit about the people who are volunteering? Yes, I think that's been one of the most incredible things is the response that we've seen from volunteers of all ages from across the city. Um, so we have had folks who were initially looking or interested in our intergenerational home share program, but then made a different decision as they were um, concerned about potentially exposing their older adult host guests or hosts um, and potentially uh, spreading uh, COVID that way. They looked at this as an opportunity to still uh, foster relationships across, um, across generations. So we have graduate students who are on the site. We have folks um, earlier on in, in the pandemic who had seen a reduction in their work hours, but were still really interested in finding a way to, to give back to support other, other folks who are experiencing difficulty at this time. So it's been really incredible to see the response and really range um, and folks who have said, I want to help support an older adult in this particular moment. Um, I think at peak, we had around 900 volunteers who are active on the site and we continue to see um, new volunteers sign up. Uh, what I'm reading between the lines is that there, there's a need for these volunteers as well. What, what, what do you think they're getting out of it? I think that one of the things that our volunteers are, are getting out of this experience is this ability to, to connect with their neighbors, to connect with residents of the city and really have an impact in a way that is very visible um, to, to be able to provide someone else who, who needs something with something that will make a, a big difference in their, not only their day, but in their week, in their life. Um, that's a really special thing to be able to do right now. What, what, what kind of a time commitment and screening uh, do you have for volunteers? Yeah, so all of the volunteers um, who sign up through the Nestorly Good Neighbors platform uh, go under or will 
go through a background check prior to being approved to fulfill requests that older adults have submitted on the site. So that is the first kind of part of the screening process. And then in terms of the time commitment, uh, it is flexible for folks. So they are able to say yes or no to requests um, based on their availability. One of the things I'm worrying about here is sort of how this fits into the chemistry of the city. And I know you've looked at this in other contexts, um, you, your, your dissertation work on the the children of people who came to Boston maybe is part of an early wave of gentrification. But aside from the downside of gentrification, I see here also a story of engagement and connecting with people even from other backgrounds. Does that play into this program as well? Yes, so at its core, our, our work around intergenerational home share and even this pivot that we've made around creating a good neighbors program is really about fostering social connection and specifically social connection across generations. Um, sometimes it can feel as though in cities like Boston, um, we have younger adults who are in their own communities. We have older adults who are in their own communities kind of separate, and there aren't always these spaces or opportunities to really bring these communities together. And so intergenerational home share was this effort to really connect older adults with these empty bedrooms, with younger folks who are looking for affordable housing. And this next kind of iteration of, of the program in response to this pandemic is kind of continuing to highlight the ways in which social connection is is important in a city and is essential to a city um, in terms of being able to share resources um, and ensure that, that folks don't feel alone, um, both now, but kind of thinking more broadly, um, that a city can be a place where you experience family, where you experience community, um, even with, its, with folks who are not members of your kind of traditional biological family. Finally, we should mention that, that if people want to help out or if they need some help, what's the best way for them to get in contact with this program? Yes, so they should go to the Good Neighbors uh, webpage. Uh, so if you just go to the Nesterly webpage, um, you will be able to find the Good Neighbors program if you're interested either in volunteering um, or if you are an older adult who needs assistance um, getting picking up groceries, you can get medicine, or just wants a friendly phone call, um, you can sign up to request those things on the Good Neighbors platform. Well, thank you very much for taking your time to be with us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. There was Dr. Taylor Kane from the Mayor's Office of Housing Innovation, who's in the Mayor's Housing Innovation Lab. We'll have more news in just a moment.